Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us, joining us tonight for the Committee as a Whole meeting, aug uh, August 7th. 2014 for Human Resources and Education. Could I have the roll call, please? Mr. Hannigan? Here. Mrs. Hines? Here. Mr. Derman? Here. Mr. Lou? Here. Mr. Harrell? Here. Mrs. Tipton? Mr. Jeter? Here. Mrs. Seely? Here. Mr. Betancourt? Here. Mr. Womack? Here. Mr. Panks? Mr. Lamarck? Here. Mr. Alfred? Here. Mrs. Balisario? And Mrs. Mullet? Present. Thank you so much. Would everyone please rise while Mr. Alfred uh, leads us in the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you saying thank you. Thank you for taking care of our children during the summer break and returning them recharged so that our teachers could be able to instruct them throughout this year for 2015. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Alford. We had no one um, to sign up tonight for five minutes or three minutes for public speaking, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to our um, approval of the minutes for the committee as a whole meeting. Uh, held July 10th for 2014. Okay, I have a, a motion by Mr. Derman, seconded by Mr. Betancourt. Do I have any comments from board members? Comments from the public? All those in favor? All those opposed? All those abstain? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. Next on our agenda, we have Dr. Melanie Schwang tonight. Uh, to speak to us about Channel 13. So, Dr. Schwang. Good evening. It's a great opportunity to be here tonight. Um, President Height, Superintendent Fulce, board members, um, central office staff, I'm very excited about sharing with you um, the latest updates on our internship programs at Channel 13. You know, it takes a team to do all the things we do, and I just want to acknowledge my Team 13, which would be David Williams and Rhett Sharp and Tiger Edwards and Kevin Mumfrey and Robert Marks and John Harrison. We all work hard to collaborate and work hard to produce the great programming that we like to air on Channel 13. You know, every time I come up here or ever since the inception of Channel 13 in 2001, it's always been the same two goals of Channel 13. To share the good news of St. Tammany Parish Public Schools and to present St. Tammany Parish Public Schools in the best light possible. And as you all know, that is not a hard job to do. There are so many wonderful things going on in the school system, and we are lucky and fortunate to be able to capture that on video and archive that for years to come. Some of the shows that we do, though, that do help share the good news and present the school system in the best light possible is our Chalk Talk, which is our news format magazine. We take anything from students of the year, teachers, principals of the year, and we air all of the great stories associated with that. We have our Prep Zone Sports, where, of course, as you know, Tiger and David and Rhett cross the district and sometimes end up in state and regional, uh, covering state and regional championships and uh, watch our student athletes perform as successfully as they do. Um, our fine arts program is, you know, none better anywhere in the state. And our choral and band concerts, even some dance performances are now covered, as well as a lot of in-house productions as well. And as you know, we cover our board meetings, we cover our graduations. And uh, the in-house productions include anything that needs to be, any information disseminated throughout the parish that needs to be shown to teachers or any employees at all, we produce those as well. But, um, you know, it's every child every day. And as a former high school teacher, I can tell you that I am very aware of how important it is to uh, reach our students and, and manage to reach the students that are interested in broadcasting so that we can do our part in making sure that our students are workforce ready and ready to go on to college. One of the things we know, especially as a technology using teacher that I was and a technology trainer for the Treen Technology Center at some point, is that student multimedia use, it increases student achievement. You know, it does promote higher level thinking and uh, critical thinking skills and media literacy and definitely it is a type of um, 
activity that, that asks for being collaborative so that students can work together and, and learn how to communicate and give and take when they produce videos. And finally, as you all know, if you put a computer screen or an iPad or an iPhone in front of anyone, maybe even like a two-year-old, they know intuitively what to do with it and their interest is immediately piqued. So when we have students working at the Channel 13 studio in our internship classroom, I can promise you there's no one off task. It is something that they are interested in, they want to do it, and there's no problem at all keeping them. As a matter of fact, sometimes it's that it's time to go and they don't even want to leave yet. So we know that technology is a, a huge impact in increasing student interest and achievement. I want to share with you some of the internship programs at Channel 13. Many of you know about our Summer Video Institute. We have a dual enrollment now. We have a traditional internship. We have a non-traditional internship. We have a college internship. And the latest that I will be sharing with you is about our AVID Learning Partnership. <coughs> Many of you are familiar with Summer Video Institute. This is our 13th year that we have offered Summer Video Institute and over those years we have reached 180 students. They've produced over 45 videos and it is absolutely collaborative. The way we handle this, it's a one-week experience where students apply. We pick 16 to 20 students. They work with one of my um, staff to produce a video of local interest and by doing that they are researching, writing, they are being the on-air talent, they're going on location, they're doing interviews, and they're gathering B-roll, and then they're coming back into the studio, and they are producing some amazing high-quality videos that they then share on the last day of the institute. It's a week-long institute. On Friday, they invite fr friends and family, broadcasting teachers, central office attends, and all the videos are shown that were produced that week. And it's, really, it's a really great time for the students because a couple of things. One is that they've not seen anybody else's video that's been produced that week. So they get to see not only their, their own being shown to their friends and family, but they get to see everybody else's as well. And also, I see it um, as a wonderful opportunity for, say, Covington High students to be able to uh, work with North Shore High students or Paul River High students working with Mandeville High students. And generally, it's a relationship that they wouldn't have maybe had any other way. By the end of the week, they are fast friends, they're sharing emails, they are friending each other on Facebook, and we think it's a great partnership that those students then have created with one another. And as a matter of fact, we work hard that if we have two or three students from one school, we make sure that they're all in separate groups so that they really get that experience across the district with other students. We've produced quite a bit of videos and uh, this is just a few but I just wanted to share a few of them with you and let you see that anywhere from you know the history of Camp Salmon to the Madisonville Museum, the Folsom Horse Farm, if any of you remember Larry uh, with the sign man, all the signs of the saints. We've done that one and of course we did Pelicans on Parade which was really one of our highest watched videos. Um, and so you can see that these are stories that we come up with that we think will be interesting for the students to produce but also um, local interest um, videos so that they can be used in the classroom. Uh, Louisiana history teachers are using these. They're going to our website, they're clicking on the link, and they are watching some of these in their classrooms, which is great ways to see three to four or five minute videos of um, topics that may be something they've been familiar with, but they, don't, they haven't really known the whole story about it yet. One of the ones, we just finished our Summer Video Institute not that long ago, and one of the videos that we produced I'd like to share with you now. Uh, it's the one on the Southern Hotel. I know it's right down the street. I think their restaurant just recently opened and it's been really great watching that renovation take place. So let's watch it now. Welcome to the Southern Hotel, located on Boston Street in downtown Covington. This historic building has been remodeled from its original design back in the early 20th century. So come on and join us while we discover this beautiful hotel. This beautiful hotel was built in 1907 in the Hispanic missionary style, later adding Mediterranean accents. After the closing of the hotel, it spent time as a drugstore, parish courthouse, Red Cross office, and has since been renovated into its former hotel glory. The hotel was built on this spot uh, because folks in this area 
I guess uh, in New Orleans, a lot of folks thought that this was a bastion of health or it had some sort of cleansing uh, effect. The architectural design of the Southern Hotel is inspired by a classic New Orleans style. Spanish Mission was a style, I guess, that was also popular during that day, and when you take a look at it, it kind of looks like a fort if you look at it from a distance with an open mind, with a couple of, uh, of squared out uh, protrusions on either side of the front of the building and the, and the archways that uh, uh, make up the entrance of the hotel. The restaurant also has some interesting ties to history with its name, Oxlot 9. Part of, the, of where the hotel stands was an ox lot. The ox lots were where they would put the, uh, the oxen to actually prepare for movement from town into the lake. The Southern Hotel has recently had restoration work done it to bring her back to her former glory day. As part of these restorations, the Oxlot 9 restaurant had been added. And also, the artwork here featured will be that of Covington artists. The artwork is, is all local. And Lisa Condry, the, the owner, is absolutely focused on the art and the interior design of the building. It's what gives this place its personality. It's, it's all meant to to be comfortable, to give you sort of a, a feeling of classic style with modern conveniences. The rooms are, are put together uh, in a boutique style of hotel, not in your standard chain. We've been overwhelmed by the support that we've had throughout uh, not just Covington, but the North Shore area. Um, our goals are to basically be a part to thrive as Covington thrives. Despite its many phases, the Southern Hotel has managed to stay beautiful for over a hundred years. Come by and see for yourself how the past and the present have merged together to create a unique landmark. You know, one of, the, one of the good points about seeing these kind of videos are that it's what we tell all of our broadcasting students and our teachers. They want to create those, you know, research-based, content-rich, socially relevant videos. And if they need to know what they look like, they can come to this site and they can see these types of videos. So it's really twofold. We can use them in history classrooms and we can also use them as really good examples of the types of videos that we want shown in our schools and produced in our schools. So as you can see, we have a wide range of, of topics here and many more than, than these. So we feel like it's a really great resource for our teachers and our students. I'll share with you now a little bit about our dual enrollment program. Uh, this is through Southeastern. Uh, we, we use the Southeastern curriculum. It's a fall semester only. We, we manage to do the dual enrollment in one semester in the fall. It's five days each week. The students come for one hour a day to our studio and they earn a half a Carnegie unit. And they're also earning three hours of college credit. Now I know we have these um, dual enrollment in our parish and this is just another way for us to stay involved with the students as well and make sure that we're doing our part to be part of that. that um, that program and one of the nice things about this one is that these you know this dual enrollment credit can can actually go anywhere not just southeastern you know they can be used at LSU they can be used at UNO so it's a, a wonderful opportunity for our students who really are ready to do that you know get that college credit and I will say this it's a rigorous course it requires a lot of um, testing it's a, it's a manual that we get from Southeastern. The professor comes in at times and monitors and watches what we're doing. And it's some projects that we normally would not do with them that Southeastern requires. So they're really getting a really good background of what it's like to be in that college level broadcasting class. Our, inter our internship that we began is called our traditional internship, and we use the Channel 13 curriculum. We, we really do, from day one, our internship has been based on the idea that it's hands-on, that we are going to get those students into the studio, in front of the camera, behind the camera, at the editing stations, learning how to be not only just the on-air talent, but learning how to 
shoot and tape and edit and write and anything else that needs to be done. And that's really the focus of our internship. You know, we tell students all the time, um, you need to be a good writer. It takes a lot of good writing skills in order to produce good video. You need to be a good researcher. You know, it's not just about being that person in front of the camera. The best on-air talent is someone who knows how to shoot and knows how to edit and knows exactly what's going to need to be done. So we want to give those students that full experience. It's five days a week, one hour a day, and they earn a half a Carnegie unit for each semester. Now what's been happening the last few years, which I think is a great uh, relationship, is that students come for one hour for their dual enrollment course, and then they spend the next hour with us getting their traditional internship. So we can take all that book knowledge and some of the things that they're asked to do at Southeastern, and that can automatically get applied right there in the studio. And uh, John Harrison is our teacher who teaches this internship class and the dual enrollment class. And I've seen him start with what he's teaching them out of the Southeastern textbook and the next hour they go into the studio and they look at the camera and they point out all of those different things. They've learned about lighting in the first hour. The second hour he puts up the lights and shows them three-point lighting or whatever it is that they've just learned. So it's a really great partnership for these students. <laughs> We also have a non-traditional internship. You know, it's an idea of not wanting to turn anyone away. It's why when I was Silver Bell's dance team sponsor in high school, I had 42 girls, okay? Because <laughs> you just don't always want to have to tell those, those kids no that are interested. So what we do for this non-traditional internship, it's one to five days a week, the hours vary, and they can earn still a half a Carnegie unit per semester. We may have a student who um, cannot come to us during uh, 1 to 3 p.m. in the afternoon because maybe she has a class that's only offered that hour and we certainly don't want to turn her away. So she might come from 11 to 12. She might come four days a week. She might come three days a week, but an hour and a half. Whatever it is, we will accommodate her schedule if she has an interest in broadcasting and wants to be able to be part of the Channel 13 internship program. As a matter of fact, this year we have two students so far registered for this internship. We also have a college internship program. This was an added bonus for us. It wasn't something I had envisioned right away until Southeastern contacted me. And um, this internship is really because Southeastern requires a business internship, a lot of times for their mass comm students. Um, it's one to five days a week. The hours vary. Sometimes it might be they're off on Friday. They spend the whole Friday with us. And they earn their college credit through their university. Um, this is a picture of Ashley Williams. Ashley is here with us tonight. She's going to share with you her experience as an intern at Channel 13. And let me just say a couple of things about her. She's a North Shore High graduate. And as you all, most of you know, this is Byron Williams' daughter and uh, a proud dad. And I can tell you that we have thoroughly enjoyed working with Ashley. And it's one of those things that we teach all of our interns about networking and staying in touch. So we are really happy that Ashley has agreed to be here tonight. And Ashley, if you would come up and share with them what you're now doing. As Melody said, I graduated from North Shore and then subsequently in college, Southeastern. But Channel 13, literally, I would not be working at WDSU as I am now if it was not for them. But before Channel 13, there was a program that I loved that I was too late to get involved in. I was broadcasting at North Shore High. I was too late to sign up. I talked to, I think it was Mrs. Desotel, and she's like, come in whenever you have time. So probably shouldn't say this, but during chemistry, once I was done with all my work, I immediately asked the teacher, can I go to broadcasting? Thankfully, he let me go. There, I actually learned that I wanted to go into broadcasting. I know in, um, I'm not sure if I'll do it as freshmen or sophomores, there's a test that they require to see what students want to do when they graduate. It's hard telling an 18-year-old or 17-year-old that just asks to go to the bathroom what they want to go, what they want to do their career in. So luckily for me, my senior year, I fi finally figured out what I wanted to do. I went to college, and my first day there was Broadcasting 101. I sat down, it was a class of over 100, and the professor said, maybe only 30 of you will graduate in broadcasting. I immediately freaked out because my dad had been telling me, you should go into nursing, that's what the <laughs> test said. But luckily I didn't listen to him. After he told me that the pressing news of only 30 people will make it, he said only 10 will actually get a job in media. 
being the one not, you know, go down without a challenge, I was determined to get a job. After going through all the courses and maybe, what, $70,000 in tuition? <laughs> Four years? I, you know, got an internship with Channel 13, and it was the most amazing experience I've ever been a part of. I often joke that, you know, I spent that much money on college in four years when I could have just did a semester at Channel 13 and learned the same thing, because that's how great the program is. It allows students to learn writing, editing, not only that, but how, to, how video gets onto the air, and that's where I work at at WDSU. It really is an amazing program. And if it were not for Melody and John and Kevin, I would not be working there because the connections they had allowed me to get a meeting with the director over there who subsequently gave me the job. But just to tell you all, it's, the school board has done so much for me, not only Channel 13, but those teachers in high school that actually influence the kids subconsciously. They don't know they're doing it half the time, but it's really amazing. Thanks. Thank you. But at WDSU, I do not do camera work unless it's in a studio or write or produce. A lot of people don't know broadcasting has a wide spectrum and communication is even wider. Over there, I'm actually an engineer and operation technician. So if equipment breaks, I have to fix it. Um, I keep us on air, make sure the commercials run, make sure all the systems are working properly so we can go on air. Anything that breaks, really, I have to learn real quick how to fix it but it's amazing what they've done and taught me with only, I think I've been there two years and I'm already in engineering, so thanks. Wow. Thank you. Right. When Ashley first, when I first heard about her over at DSU, once I knew that she'd gotten a job over there, I was just so impressed that she was already working in master control. You know, right. just amazing. So Ashley, thank you. We're so proud of you, darling. I'd like to share with you now a little bit about the latest thing that we've been uh, working with at um, Channel 13, which is an AVID learning partnership. And I want to start by telling you what AVID is. AVID is an industry standard editing software. And that's important because AVID is what they're using in the movies. It's what they're using in Hollywood South. It's the editing software so that when you sit, and if you've ever been into Channel 13 or you see your, maybe your kids are using it, timelines, monitors, screens, lots of manipulation that can take place. Um, Avid even has color-coded keyboards to help, double monitors, everything that can be used to assist in the production of high-quality editing is part of Avid. And it is not easy to learn. It is a challenge because I learned it as a classroom teacher going into Channel 13. Um, but I'm happy to say and very proud to say that Channel 13 now has all of our staff AVID certified instructors. And this comes at a, at a, it wasn't easy to get there. It was rigorous training, rigorous testing, but as a result of the staff, we are an AVID learning partner, and we are only two AVID learning partners school district-wise in the state of Louisiana. We are only five in the country. So for Channel 13 in St. Tammany Parish Public Schools to be an AVID learning partner is just so exciting and truly a vision that is something I, I really would have thought would have had to have taken a lot more time before we would get there. But we're here and the good news is what we can do with it. We can now certify our students in an industry-based certification called AVID Certified Users, ACU. So just as we can have EMTs, we can have ACUs. So for those students, the Ashleys in the school district who are interested in broadcasting and are seeking a career in it, they can now be certified as an AVID certified user. And one of the other great, one of the, it's really one of the reasons why I thought this would be such a great idea to do is that this gives them the opportunity to go work in Hollywood South. We all know all the movies that have been made you know, in Hollywood South, our students with an AVID certified user certification can go right into the workforce out of high school or go into college and work on the side in Hollywood South industry. Uh, one of the things that they need because they use AVID is that they need editors to come in and edit their dailies, just that daily film that's been shot. And that's something that 
a student can do who is AVID certified. Um, they can work summers, they can work holidays. Um, I spoke with a young man um, in another area of the country when we were trying to find out a little bit more information about it. And he worked the last two summers in Hollywood South editing daily, so big name movies. And he, they actually sent him over to Washington, D.C. to do some additional work. So this is one of those things where, and especially, you know, coming from the high school teacher place, that I am thrilled and excited that we are giving, we have the opportunity to give students a certification that can really make them workforce ready. They can go out and either go into college with it and then blow the professors away that they're AVID certified, you know, and they can, or they can go right into the film industry and work. So we are thrilled about this partnership, and it's a vision that I think is worth working towards and fulfilling. And I also want to share one other thing, our plan with it. Our plan, and we've just found this out just a few weeks ago, that we are now um, an AVID learning partner. So what we'd like to do as a result of that is work on a professional development rollout that's going to train our broadcasting teachers in AVID. You know, right now they're using it. Um, not all of them are real qualified yet in it. They're not, they haven't used it a lot. So we want to want to work closely with those teachers and give them the experience and the training they need so that their first step is that they will become an AVID certified user. From there, with a little bit more experience on a day-to-day -day basis using it, they can become AVID certified instructors. And we can certify our students then um, in this certification so that they can go out and get the jobs that they want and follow their dreams if it happens to be in AVID, you know, editing and AVID in the film industry. So we're very excited about it and I do want to acknowledge just the support of, of Mr. Fols and especially Ms. Araby in um, helping us um, achieve this partnership. We consider it um, really exciting and a really big push for our school system and a great opportunity for our students. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. You okay, finished. one more thing. I apologize. That's okay, Robin. Thank you. Um, you know, just as Ashley's here today, um, we have our alumni, and every time I present before the board, I like to share with you their update. You know, what are they doing now? And I'm going to tell you, I always say, I look at these kids and I go, I'm going to say one day I knew you when, because you guys are doing well. Your names are going to be up in lights, or you're going to be doing exactly like what Ashley's doing right now. And Ashley didn't even tell you her how busy she's about to get during football season or hurricane season either, right Ashley? Yeah, she's going to have a lot going on. Um, here's some of these, I'm sure you recognize some of these names or faces. Trevor Cassidy, uh, the first story, one of the first stories I produced at Channel 13 was Trevor Cassidy when he was the WDSU Student Entrepreneur of the Year. And he began broadcasting at Mandeville Junior High. He is the one that got their school wired. He is now promotions manager at WWLTV. He told me just the other day he's actually a boss and has two employees, <laughs> which he said was a little daunting. Uh, Grant Yenny, we just found out, has been hired with WWL, a sports producer. I think he's going to be working on high school football, which is perfect for Grant. Grant oftentimes worked with us in prep zone. Michael Kelly, I know you all are familiar with Michael. He is in Jacksonville as an anchor and last year won a Suncoast mm -hmm. Emmy for his work. And uh, Caitlin Morales, she has been in the newspaper lately. You may have seen the article about her. She is a student and works with the Southeastern Channel, but also was one of a very few students across the country chosen to be an intern with NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams. And I will tell you, I spoke with Caitlin the other day. She has had a dream that she is going to work on the Today Show, and I'm telling you, I'm sure she will. Okay, she's already made some contacts. Um, and as you know, Michael Kelly did incredible work for us, and um, you know he is just doing a beautiful job in Jacksonville. Lauren Zimmerman uh, is with Tiger TV still in college. You may remember her from when she was one of the nine Got Milk girls a couple years ago. One of nine chosen across the country to publicly communicate the importance of drinking milk. We like to say part of, that ta part of that opportunity came because she was so great in front of the camera and got lots of opportunities to do that. And uh, Bobby Kirkpatrick, who now goes by Rob, um, he started out as a morning producer in uh, Dallas, and now he is a supervisor at CNN. Uh, what an exciting job for Bobby. Chris Hewitt, I know you're familiar with Chris, a post-production assistant at DreamWorks. Talk about following your dream and seeing that happen. Um, I had the opportunity when one of his uh, movies that he worked on from DreamWorks came out into the big theater last year. Um, 
went to the show to see it, and I always stay for credits. I read them all, and there's Chris Hewitt's name. What a moment. It was just really exciting, really proud of him. And uh, Kristen Althaus, she is um, working with Tiger TV, too, as well. So those, those, those students of ours still in broadcasting, still producing videos. We had one of our interns come back, Amy Borax, who was here last year receiving some awards for her work, came back to do some editing for some schoolwork and used um, her old computer. So we love having these kids. We love staying in touch with them, and especially when we can have the the girls like Ashley come back and talk to us. Andrew Franzella, you may recognize him from uh, Prep Zone as well. He has been interning with Doug Mouton at WWL TV. And our very own Ashley, and that's a shot of her in Master Control that we've been so proud of. <laughs> so I don't even know what she, to do with all that stuff, Ashley. So yeah, it's a lot of buttons, that's right. <laughs> And so finally, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to share with you what we've been doing at Channel 13 to make sure that we're touching the lives of our students. And once again, for your support, Mr. Fulce, Ms. Heinz, Ms. Araby, Ms. Mullet, for all of you, thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you Channel 13. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions or comments for um, Dr. Swain? The science. Melanie, I just wanted to congratulate you and your staff for the recent awards you just won, and not only you, but our public information office, too. Congratulations Thank to you, you all. We, it's further evidence that we're getting quality work from your departments. Thank you so much. Mr. Alfred. Thank you. Um, for your AVID uh, certification, do they get college credit for that also? No, this is a strictly an industry-based certification that they will receive. Now, if they want to come for the dual enrollment course, they will get college credit for that. Okay, because it looks like when they get to college, if they have to have it, they're just so far ahead of everybody else. They are. As a matter of fact, we had the first year that Michael Kelly, he had graduated, gone on to Mizzou, gave us a call and said, you're not going to believe it. I walked into my first course and the professor told me, he was blown away that he knew AVID, and he said, you can just come back at the end of the semester. And then another student told us that he was asked to just be an assistant for that semester since he already knew AVID. They couldn't believe that these high school students were coming out knowing AVID. Now, we have so many great artists here in St. Tammany. Do you have a course in AVID that could use their, their uh, artistic sketches or to run a different program? Well, I will tell you this. There's a great graphics package that goes along with AVID, and I always say Rhett Sharp has become our, our graphics uh, department. Mm -hmm. So through AVID, you can do lots of different graphics. It's not, it probably is freehand as well, but you can, you can really, as we used to say, put the bells and whistles on the videos using the graphics package that's part of AVID. Perfect. You've done, you're doing an excellent job. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> Well, Dr. Swang, it, it, just, it just shows how, what wonderful things we're doing in our school system mm -hmm. and um, how, once again, our public school, St. Tammany Parish Public School, sets the bar for the rest of the state, and I'm very proud. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we have no further, um, n nothing further on the agenda, so we are adjourned, and we're going to uh, take a five-minute break, and then Mr. Derman will begin his meeting. All right, thank you all very much. Uh, we're going to go ahead and call the committee as a whole meeting for August 7, 2014 for the St. Annie Parish School Board Business Affairs Administrative. Roll call, please. Mr. Derman? Here. Mr. Hannigan? Here. Mrs. Hines? Here. Mr. Lou? Here. Mr. Harrell? Here. Mrs. Tipton? Mr. Jeter? Here. Mrs. Seeley? Here. Mrs. Mollett? Present. Mr. Betancourt? Here. Mr. Womack? Mr. Here. Pank? Here. Mr. Panks, Mr. Lamar, Here. Mr. Alfred, Here. Mrs. Belisario. Thank you very much. Um, due to some um, time um, elements here, we're going to ask that we move up item 12, which is business affairs. If no one has an objection, uh, 
so that we can discuss those things so Mr. Schroeder can uh, go to his next appointment. Seeing none, so we'll go to business affairs. Ms. Prevost. Um, we're going to do the first item? Yes, let's okay. go ahead and just go through that whole section. Consideration of proposals received from fiscal agent effective October 1st, 2014 to September 30th, 2017. And uh, Mr. Fols is going to elaborate on that. Thank you, Mr. Derman. Um, board members, tonight we would like to recommend that um, Capital One Bank be granted the renewal of their contract with the school system to serve as fiscal agent. We sent applications out to 19 um, banking institutions in St. Tony Parish that were chartered. Uh, three agencies put in bids for the work and after review by a committee as well as the past history, we would recommend the board to uh, Capital One continue as the fiscal agent for our school system. So, all right, so moved by Mr. Alford, second by Mr. Loop. Um, any comments or questions by board members from the public? Would someone from Capital One want to speak or address the board? Or you don't have to. We'll wait till after the vote. Yeah. Mr. Fole said we'll wait till after the vote. So that that's okay. Sorry about that. Seeing no other comments. So all in favor on the board? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? So ordered. Now you can come up and talk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Superintendent Pulse, distinguished board members. Just want to thank you for the uh, trust that you put in Capital One and just continuing the relationship and the partnership that we've enjoyed for over 25 years. And on behalf of myself and, and uh, Dennis Sheck Snyder, who has come before this board uh, several times in the past. Uh, for scholarship and, and uh, award sponsorships. We certainly do appreciate the business and we want to just continue to enhance, enhance our relationship and continue the partnership that we've enjoyed for so many years. So thank you. Thank you very much. And we also enjoy, um, you know, the community connections that we have with, with Capital One and, and um, all the, over the years that uh, the great service that we've received. So we appreciate y'all as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to item B. Next item, Ms. Prevost. To consider and take action with respect to adopting a resolution with respect to the municipal municipalities continuing disclosure cooperative initiative of the Securities and Exchange Commission. And Mr. Sluter is here to explain. Hello. Thank you very much. Grant Schluter for the Udell Bond Council, and I'll give you the short version. Uh, this is an initiative from the SEC. It's uh, with respect to all public bodies with outstanding bond issues that are subject to the continuing disclosure requirements uh, and the requirement that uh, updated information be filed annually with a central repository. Uh, the SEC uh, a while back uh, did a little survey nation nationwide and found that there was widespread uh, less than 100 percent compliance with all of their requ reporting requirements. So they have mandated that all public bodies with any outstanding bond issues subject to these requirements, which is virtually every public body in the country <laughs> that has issued two or more bond issues in the last five years that they do a review of all of their outstanding bond issues going back at least five years and potentially 10 years to scrutinize every filing made pursuant to these continuing disclosure requirements. And if there are any deficiencies or less than 100 uh, percent compliance to report those to the SEC by a submission by the deadline of December 1. And the underwriters who have purchased any bonds have to make uh, separate list and they have to uh, submit that by September 9th. Uh, the state of Louisiana, the State Bond Commission, uh, the Treasurer Kennedy are undertaking a review of all the state issues, state agency issues. Uh, they've retained two firms to assist them with that. We are one of those firms that is assisting the state in their review. We're also uh, assisting with the review for all the local public clients that we work with, including the St. Tammany Parish School Board. Uh, 
the resolution that you have here before you for consideration next week at the full board meeting is being adopted across the state by many, many school boards and cities and parishes and special districts and so forth. And it basically authorizes, uh, in this case, uh, 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 your finance person to make this submission by December 1 if in consultation with bond council and general council it's determined that a submission should be made. Uh, we anticipate on December 1 that there will be a very large amount of submissions across the country. Uh, some uh, press reports have indicated perhaps 60,000 public bodies across the country. And we just want to make sure that you're prepared and you have the authority to make that submission. There is no repercussion to the school board uh, for any submission uh, uh, with respect to any outstanding bond issue. But we anticipate the state, state agencies, and most of the public bodies across Louisiana and across the country will be making submissions of some type by that deadline of December 1. And that's the short version, but I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Grant. Any questions by board members? Mr. Hennigan. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so can I ask if we do make a motion to accept this resolution, which I would support, by the way, that, that we get a copy of that submission? Was that the plan? This just wouldn't? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Good. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments, board members? Okay, I need a motion. Okay. Uh, motion by Ms. Seeley, seconded by Mr. Hennigan. Any other questions or comments by board members? Any comments or questions from the public? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstain? So ordered. Okay, thank, thank you, Grant. You, thank you for taking me up early. I appreciate it. No problem. Good luck on your travel there. Okay, now item C, monthly purchasing report. The monthly purchasing report is in your packets, and Mr. Stevens is here to answer any questions you may have. Any questions by board members? Okay, seeing none, we can go straight to announcements from the president. <laughs> 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 oh, got to go back. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. All right. So we're going to move back to item four, which is approval of the minutes for the committee as a whole meeting held July 10th, 2014. Do I have a motion? So moved by Ms. Heinz. Second. I second. Seconded by Mr. Jeter. Any comments by board members? Comments by public? Seeing none. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstain, so ordered. Okay, item five, consideration of a new resolution adopted by St. Tammany Parish Board for the minimum foundation program litigation for fiscal year 2012-13. Mr. Foles. Thank you, Mr. Derman. Board members, uh, Mr. Derman, if I could, I'd like to discuss five, six, and seven at the same time since they all seem to go together. What you have tonight is consideration of uh, two resolutions and a fee agreement dealing with one issue dealing, dealing with a continuation of a resolution, one new resolution, and then a contingent fee. To address item five, what you have is a resolution. If you recall, this board adopted a resolution a year or so ago to support this lawsuit to recoup minimum foundation program monies Initially, this litigation was started by St. John the Baptist Parish. Many other school systems joined in. And the main focus of this petition, this resolution, was to try to recoup MFP money that school boards across the state believe was owed to local school systems dating back for the four years that we did not receive our MFP money from the, schools, from the uh, State Department. When this initial resolution was submitted, the Attorney General basically kicked it out because the Attorney General stated that the fee agreement and power of attorney was not included in the resolution. So what you see in item number seven catches up with that and makes that part of the um, resolution and makes it legal from the Attorney General's point of view. Item number six is a new resolution. This resolution deals with receiving MFP money from the 13-14 school year. If you remember this past year, we got a $750 
monies, but it was a one-time stipend. It was not put into the formula. It was not put into the base. This resolution requests that the State Department and the State of Louisiana include that $750 in the base as well and also takes care of the attorney fee agreement that would go with that. So item five is kind of like a second time around from a resolution you passed a year ago making it right with the uh, fees for the attorneys. Item six is a new resolution trying to get the $750 from this past year put into the formula. And item number seven is the contingent fee agreement of power attorney that the attorney general stated must be included for either one of these two resolutions to be considered moving forth. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah, I, if I may, I guess what it looks like is Item five and item seven are both housekeeping to, to clean up. Seven goes with six, too, though, and it's required for both. Okay. All right, so it's partly housekeeping and Correct. new. Correct. Okay. But I think you need to consider each one on their own merit. Right. We're going to take each item individually. So right now we're dealing with item five. Okay. And so do I have a motion from board members? Moved by Mr. Panks, seconded by Ms. Mullet. All right, now we've got questions by board members. Looks like everybody understands what we're doing. That's good. Okay, any questions or comments by the public? Seeing none. So all those in favor of item five, say aye. aye. Oppose, abstain, so ordered. So item five passes. Moving on to item six, which is consideration of new resolution adopted by the St. Tammany Parish School Board for the minimum foundation program litigation for the fiscal year 2013-14. And as Mr. Foles had already discussed that, and the resolution is in your folders. Yes. So any comments or questions by board members? Moved by Mr. Alford, seconded by Mr. Harrell. Um, any, again, any questions? From the board, from the public, seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstain? So ordered. Item 7, consideration of contingent fee agreement and power of attorney for the minimum foundation program litigation for fiscal year 2013-14. Do I have a motion? Motion by Mr. Loop, second by Ms. Seeley. Any discussion or questions by board members? From the public, seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, abstain, so ordered. Okay, we went through that pretty well. Item eight, consideration of District Cooperative of Louisiana or DCL agreement renewal. Mr. Foles. Thank you, Mr. Derman. Board members, you have a copy of this um, agreement renewal in your packet tonight. If you recall a year ago, we were approached by Vermilion Parish and other school systems joined as well in this cooperative agreement among school systems to pool resources, pool information, and just to co-op and gather together to strengthen the initiatives that we're dealing with across the state um, from uh, local school systems. Uh, the cost to continue this renewal for school systems our size is $2,000. Um, this cooperative is only one year old and certainly is growing as we go forth. We do believe we received some benefits from it this past year, and we also do believe that moving forward there are more benefits to be received, as well as I believe it's an opportunity for our school system to share many of the things that we have going on with other systems in the co-op. And for those reasons and for the cost involved, our recommendation to the board would be that we renew this cooperative agreement moving forward for another year. Okay. Ms. Muller moves, uh, makes a motion to approve. Ms. Seeley seconds it. Any discussion or comments from board members? Mr. Bedencourt? Yeah, I suppose directed toward Mr. Folks, could we maybe just for the public's sake point out one or two of the benefits from this past year? We understand that it's an ongoing and it's going to grow and really get better, uh, but I think it might be beneficial to throw out a few examples. I think a couple examples that come right off the top of my head is our virtual school and um, information that we've learned from that, sharing experiences that other systems have. And then since we've had ours for a year to also share with others, uh, Common Core mm -hmm. dealing with those standards has certainly been something that we shared with others. And then just the opportunity to get together and talk about the many challenges that are coming our way uh, as a school systems, we've been able to do that. I know I think Regina is our contact person, so Regina 
participates in different committees and uh, conference calls to keep us abreast with that. Um, purchasing opportunities, Lewis has shared information with them on some of the things that we've done with infrastructure and wireless opportunities. As, a, as superintendents, we get to gather and discuss some of the challenges that we're dealing with. So I think it's a year going, there's been some growing pains, but I think the potential for the organization is certainly worth the um, monies that's invested. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I agree with you 100 percent. Thank you, Mr. Bettencourt. Any other comments from board members? And, and I do want to reiterate, this is a $2,000 a year cost, so it's not very expensive from that perspective. So, And we've saved way more than $2,000 by being a member of it. And I think so. it's brought up uh, earlier by a board member, I think it was Mr. Lamarck, said we're also it's an opportunity for us to share some of the things that we have going on and to offer um, opportunities for other districts as well. Okay, thank you, Mr. Foles. Any other comments or questions by board members from the public? Okay, seeing none, so all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstain? So ordered. Okay, item nine. This may be where it gets a little longer. Consideration of policy relative to Act 853 of the 2014 legislative session. Um, Me. I'm going to go to Mr. Foles and let him discuss that a little bit, and then we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Durbin. Board members, uh, tonight you have at, at your desk a draft copy of a policy that we've put together, as well as a copy of the actual Act 853, which is by Senator Nevers, which is commonly known as the School Choice Act. Uh, let me just give you a brief overview of what the Act says, and then we can certainly discuss this draft policy that we put before you. Basically, this act says if there's a student attending a D or F school, either within our school system or outside St. Tammy Parish Public School System, that that student has the right or an opportunity to attend the A, B school within St. Tammany Parish. So, in other words, if there's a student attending a D or F school in another parish other than St. Tammany and they would like to come to one of our A, B, or C schools, this act gives them the opportunity or the right to do that. Uh, a couple things about the act. It states that local school authorities, local school boards must create a policy on how to implement this act. Part of what the creating of the policy is, is to define what the capacity is. The law states as long as there's capacity at the receiving school, then that student is entitled to attend. Part of our challenge was to define what capacity is in the schools and in our school system. So that's part of the draft that you, you will see there as well. We've also put some um, money stipulations into our draft policy. We've put some um, extracurricular statements in there. We put some discipline type issues in there. So basically the policy, the draft that you see before you today meets what we believe the law is in that it says if there's a student attending a D or F school that wants to come to one of our A, B, or C schools, they have the right to do that if these following criteria are met. One of the criteria is that the school that was receiving must not be at capacity. In our draft that you've given to you tonight, we define capacity as if we have reached 80 percent of the potential enrollment at that particular school, 80 percent of the potential enrollment. We also in our policy state that we know by law that the MFP money must come with that student because they were being counted in our enrollment. But in our policy, we are also asking for the local shares from the school system that that student is coming from come with that student. In other words, if the local share, if that student's sending district receives money, then not only would we get the MFP money, but we would also get the monies that would be the local share from that receiving district. We just don't believe that if a student's in our district from another parish, that it costs more than just the MFP money to educate that child. There's a local share that our taxpayers pay. And we believe if a student comes from another parish, then those taxes from that other parish should follow that student so that we are basically made whole by receiving that student. We also have a stipulation in there if the child has been at alternative school before or has been suspended or expelled from that particular school system that they would not qualify to come to us. Also, once they get in our school system, if they're expend, uh, suspended, expelled, or have any of that criteria, then we would have the opportunity to uh, take them out of our system 
as well. So that's kind of like an overview. I will tell you up until I would say 5.30 this afternoon, I was receiving emails back and forth by Scott Reshort and LSBA, as well as the executive board of the Superintendents Association that I sit on. And there are many, many different ideas, thoughts, opinions on how this should all play out. We just thought it was important to get something in your hands tonight. Uh, since our next meeting would be a month away, I will tell you that we are already getting calls from parents outside of our school system that are asking to allow their students to come in our system. Um, we have told them that we don't have a policy in place yet, and we're continuing to work on that policy. And until we do, we will get back in touch with them. But I know uh, other districts, other superintendents I've been talking to, they're at the same time frame of us in their committee as a whole waiting for final approval. Also know that Scott Reshard, as well as our association, has been in communication with Superintendent White and the uh, State Board of Education, and there's some um, discussions ongoing about the intent of this law, the implementation of the law. We believe that the law reads that it is the authority as well as the responsibility of the local school districts to draft a policy. I'm not sure everybody believes the same way, but we certainly do, and that's the path we're going to take so that's why we're giving this to you tonight and hopefully uh, with your input and suggestions we can craft a policy that meets the law uh, get it approved tonight and then final approval uh, next Thursday and probably I'll have an update for you on some of the ongoings between now and next Thursday that could impact our final approval uh, a week from tonight thank you mr. Fultz that's quite a summary right there thank you uh, board members uh, Ms. Heinz I have a few <coughs> housekeeping um, comments. Um, um, well, before I give you those, I'll say that I believe requiring the local share of dollars coming from um, the other parishes is a great idea. And I also appreciate uh, a definition of capacity. I think those are two great things to have in it. But um, in the first paragraph, uh, where you have SPS, I wish you would spell out school performance score because someone reading the policy might not be familiar with what that is. And then um, down under verification of initial eligibility, in item C, uh, it, I think it should state the parent or guardian shall identify the school. Then, um, I would ask that you spell out uh, on the last page MFP if you would put minimum foundation program there. So those are just a few minor housekeeping issues, but I, I thought they were important to mention. We don't need to vote on those, do we? Those are just clean up. Thank you, Ms. Heinz. Uh, this has been a pretty fluid document, and I'm working hard to get it to you tonight, and we appreciate another set of eyes on that for sure. Mr. Hennigan. I'm sorry, Ms. Heinz, are you through? For the time being. Okay. Yes, thank you. And, and Mr. Dearman and Ms. Heinz, I think all your suggestions are great, too. Um, two, two quick questions. Uh, the last one on the share, the, the wording is uh, of, of consent to home school districts, last page, part A, to make payment to the system in the amount equal to the St. Tammany Parish school system local per pupil amount recognized in the MFP. Is, does that include our capital expenditures, or is it just operating general? Yeah, fund? I don't. MFP doesn't provide for capital, so. Can we add that too? I mean, because you know we got to provide us the classroom. Mr. Anakin, you we can. I'm certainly open to whatever. Don't, the I mean, wishes it's, of it's the a, board. It's a pretty good chunk of our, our uh, tax dollars goes to providing for classrooms. I and agree with you, Mr. Well, So, do next. you want to make that motion to amend it? If, if uh, it's the board's pleasure, yes, I'd like to. Uh, okay, you I'd got like a motion to, on the floor uh, to amend. Offer a friendly amendment that we add uh, and local uh, capital Howell, funds. Yeah. All right, seconded by Mr. Harrell. Okay, does everybody understand what, what Mr. Hennigan's motion is? We didn't have the original motion in before discussing it. Okay, I think you may be right. Okay, Ms. Heinz makes the original motion. Second. Second by Mr. Betancourt. 
Okay, so now we're in full discussion here. So we're looking at a friendly amendment, as what Mr. Hennigan says, and adding um, the local part of our local capital uh, expenses into the local per pupil amount recognized. And, and it was seconded by yeah, Mr. Harrell. Yeah, and, and you know, the problem is that the expenditures change every year, so to me it would be the bond repayment amount. You know, it would be our annual, uh, that stays pretty level, huh? Or not? No? Not the payments, the taxes do. Taxes. Okay. And, and let, let me look at, let us look as a staff on some options, and we'll okay. give you some options next Thursday. Okay. To and, form less. Yes, sir. And, and if I may ask, right, who are we asking to repay this? Are we asking yes. the students' parents to pay this, or are we asking the school district that it's coming from? But the district doesn't have any choice in whether or not the kid comes or the child comes to our school, do they? It says in the first line of the school system, these things are below that. So this would be the school system from which the student is coming from. I understand. I understand what you're saying, but I'm asking if, in fact, does the school system from which they're coming from have the ability to deny that student to come to us if they can't afford to pay this I think the ability to, den to deny would become from us denying it if these if these requirements are not met okay so if that local school district cannot pay that amount that we associate for that year per student based on MFP our local and um, for for um, capital and uh, e education purposes, all of those combined, then that student can't come to our school district. We, we would not be able to accept a student okay. if that's the wishes of the board. Okay, I'm just trying to make sure I understand what we're, what that definition or what that change may mean. Mr. Alford. That was on the same line that I was thinking too, Mike. Um, when we get the written consent from that local school, from that the losing school system, they already will be agreeing that they're going to pay us that, correct? Yes. Sir. Is that what we're saying? That's what this policy says. Right. They would have to be in agreement to match our to total match expenditure our per student allocation. Okay. Yes. Both for education purpose, instruction purpose, and, and, and you know, capital improvements. Say a, say a parent from Jefferson goes to their school, to, to, to a school system, and asks them to give a written consent to send one of the Jefferson kids over to our school and they sign they send a uh, written consent over to us but they might not be aware that that written consent is saying that they're going to pay us these amount of funds how we how we get that to Jefferson that they know that they're going to pay us you better ask somebody that knows well, that I, question I, I, well, <laughs> I mean there'll, there'll be a communication between the the parents of the student that are requesting and before they we can receive them as a student we will contact the, re the system that's sending them to us and they will have to sign a document agreeing to whatever stipulations that we said that y'all put in place that's 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 what I'm okay I'm good. so but in essence it's like a contract first with, thing we'll do first thing we'll do is check the eligibility of the student are they coming from a D or F school do they want to come to ABC's from us then we'll see the numbers that the system that they're coming from, we'll check their MFP, we'll check their local share, and we'll come up with a formula for construction if that passes tonight, and then we'll send that to the system that the child is coming from, and if they agree to it, then we would accept the student if they, we have capacity at the school that they're wishing to come to, and if they don't agree to it, then we wouldn't be able to accept that child. Okay. All right, Ms. Sealing. Thank you, Mr. German. Under single point of contact. Wait a minute. Are we through? Are we through with this one first item talking I'm about sorry. the the funding mechanisms? Because we have to vote on that before we move on. Okay, this is on the same draft though. Yeah, it's, it's on the same point. draft. But I'm okay. let's take one item at a time and let's vote on this. It means we already have a motion on the floor. This is on the funding on on item A on the consent of home school district, item A to make payment to the system in the amount equal to the St. Anthony Parish School System local per pupil amount recognized in the MFP 
for the school year, for for the school year, but including, I guess, Neil, how did you want to word that? Well, Cap I'll leave, I'll leave it up to the administration, but something related to the tax that's collected for that. that that's the funding, the tax funding for okay. local capital improvements as well? Yeah. To include capital improvements? That's what I would say. Okay, my suggestion would be that you make a substitute motion to include this in the policy and vote on that before we would go any further in the motion. Right, Harry? Right. And that's what we have a motion on the floor. Okay. And we're just trying to clarify that. And we have a second by <coughs> Mr. Harrell. No, I want to vote. Now you want to make a comment, on right? On a substitute motion. On a substitute motion. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Harrell. Uh, most of the parishes around, their local contribution per student is not nearly what St. Tammany's is. It would be less for the most part, yes. So are we asking the, them to pay, you know, if let's use a number, if their local uh, contribution is $2,000 and ours is six, are we asking them to pay six or are we the asking difference them? between, we're asking them to make up the difference and make us whole on what it costs to educate that child in St. Tanny Parish. Should we, that be the state's responsibility versus the local parish well, that's coming Well, the state only puts up the MFP money, which we will be receiving on that child. Right. The other money comes from the local district that's losing that student. So I don't think you can make that a state requirement. The parish that's losing its student because it's a D or an F school is basically because of the, you know, economics has a big impact on them. So if it, if we're going to, uh, and I'm all for doing this, but I'm just saying that's going to be a bigger drag on them financially if they're going to have to put up a bigger percentage <laughs> of their MFP right. money to it. They're, they're not putting up their MFP money because that child is coming to us. We get that. We get the MFP money, the local share. And I'm just going to talk in general numbers so Terry don't correct me. It costs us about $10,000 to educate a student. We get about $4,000, 3700 Huh? I said don't correct me. $5,000 <laughs> uh, for a student. So there's a $5,000 difference. Right. If that student is sitting in one of our classrooms, we're short $5,000. What we're saying is the system that's sending that child to us has to make up that difference so that we're made whole to educate that child for the same cost it costs to educate any other child because I'm not really thinking that a St. Tammy Parish taxpayer should have to pay their taxes to educate a student outside of a system. And I don't want anybody to take this as a reflection against any of our regional systems, but I think, and you see in our policy, our number one charge, our number one responsibility is to educate the students that live in St. Tanny Parish. Yes. And that's what we're trying to do, and that has to be our first priority. We agree. And th I, don't, I don't want this to come across as something against our, our neighbors, but it has to be a responsibility that we cannot kind of basically go in the hole to receive students outside of our system if we were expected to spend the monies we need to spend on, this, on the students that live in St. Tammany Parish. Right. No, and I totally agree with that. I just, uh, I think, you know, this is going to be a very, I think I'm very much against this law in general and, and because I think it's very detrimental to the parents, parishes that are losing students. It's going to be detrimental to us receiving the students. Uh, so, but I will certainly support the motion. And Mr. Howe, I agree with you. I mean, this is almost like taxation without representation based on the way that this, this law or act was, was created. So, I mean, uh, and like Mr. Foles says, our, our number one charge as St. Tammany Parish School Board and the school, public school system is to provide the services for our resident students in our community. I mean, that's who elected us. I mean, I didn't get a vote from anybody from Washington Parish or Tangible Hope. <laughs> I mean, and I don't wish them any hard luck, but I didn't get a vote from them. I got voted in by the people in St. Tammany Parish, and that's who I'm going to sit here and represent. So as the most in difficult restrictions that we can place in this policy, I'm for it, because that's who we're representing. Now, if the state legislature, in their great wisdom, would like to reword this thing, to where it's more beneficial to everyone, and or maybe just withdraw it, I'd be in favor of that as well. But for right now, we're representing St. Tammany as far as my viewpoint. Ms. Heinz. 
or a decrease in the state share and an increase in the local share over the last couple of years. So we have to protect ourselves and our taxpayers. It's Absolutely. It's important. And we don't want to have a negative impact on any of our school performance scores and our district performance scores. And I mean, it's almost like this is based on everything that's going on in education today. This is, appears to be a well-crafted item that could create difficulties for our school system. And I'm definitely against it. And uh, I know all y'all are as well. And I'm sorry I'm preaching. I'm, I'm sorry I shouldn't be doing that. But um, we do have a motion on the floor. It's seconded. Any discussion, any more discussion by board members? Substitute motion. It's on the substitute amendment. OK. Any comments by the public? Seeing none, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? So ordered. Okay, so. Back on the original. Back on the original motion. Okay, Ms. Seeley, you Thank had you. a comment. Yes, I did. Um, under the part where it, uh, the language says single point of contact, that would be on the first page of the draft. Second paragraph. Second paragraph, it's B. Um, I know that we require out of all of our students to have, when they enroll in our school system, to have evidence of residency. Is this something that we need to add to our language or is this something that um, is needed? Well, the evidence of residency is really not important in here. They can live anywhere they want. That will certainly be part of our registration process, but where they live does not determine their eligibility in this program. Right, understand, um, but I didn't know if that was something that we needed to have in our well, records. We, any student that enrolls, we need their address, so we certainly okay. would get that, yes. Thank you. Well, we would have to confirm what district they're coming from. That's part the of the confirmation right. procedures that would be in place, and we have to confirm that the school they're coming from, it would be a DRF school, the school they want to come from, ABC, capacity. Yes, there's okay. a lot of checks and balances. That's why we felt in crafting this that it needed to initiate it out of our two annexes and to make it clear that that's where the traffic would come. Okay. So do we need to uh, add this in our language? No, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other um, items or comments or questions, Mr. Bettencourt? Yeah, could you go, uh, someone go into a little bit of explanation of uh, how we arrived at the 80% uh, capacity? Because I kind of think it maybe should be 75 to protect space for our children our students in St. Tammany. So, so you're talking about verification of capacity item D. Is that what where you're going, Ron? Yes, it's just I, I'd like to be uh, interested in how we came to that 80 percent um, because it's pretty vague in the act. It just says capacity, right? That's correct. And that came from um, discussion with fellow superintendents as well as um, counsel from um, Danny Garrett as well as conversation with LSBA. Okay. Yeah, but as I mentioned at the very beginning, um, certainly open to any wishes of the board. Okay, Mr. Harrell. Could we add if we have portable uh, units at that school that that would automatically uh, indicate that it's over capacity? I mean, I'm open to any wishes of the board. Okay, are you making that a motion? Yeah, I'd like to make a friendly amendment. Okay. I don't think these are friendly amendments. Okay. They're just amendments to, yeah. the, to the motion. I mean, they changed the, the motion dramatic, drastically, and I'm fine with it, but I don't think it's a friendly amendment. Okay, so it's an amendment to the motion. Yes. And they, I got a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Sealing. Okay, does, is there questions or comments by board members of what or clarification? Mr. Bettencourt. So um, what Mr. Harrell is actually suggesting, like an item G in that, in that area there pertaining to portable buildings on a particular campus? Okay. I think it would still be included in item D if you're talking about capacity at the 80%. <clears throat> It's just saying well, that you could add, add it to item D or 
uh, make it item G or whatever, make it item 17. But I think it might help clarify that capacity percentage. Um, My suggestion, Mr. Bedko, would be to be part of item D and you go ahead and include, for purpose of determining capacity, any school which has a portable or modular building would be ineligible to receive a student. That they would be in excess, excess of capacity, and therefore the 80% wouldn't apply. So can't we just put a portable building at all of our schools and be done with it? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you want to make a motion? <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry, Mr. Alfred. Thank you. Your 80 percent, which is capacity, should take care of having a portable or any other type of building on your campus. The term 80 percent would just automatically give you if your school is 80 percent full, regardless if you've got a, a, a portable or what. If it's 80 percent full, you're done. It you says in, in the grade. Huh? In this, it says in the grade in which the student seeks to enroll. Well, I, I mean, I think if we're saying eighty percent of capacity, it would be the capacity of the which school, right? Would be the capacity which includes modules and portables in the buildings the way it's written now. Right. If you want to change that and add modules or portables, then it would automatically eliminate a school if that school indeed had a modular or portable before you even applied the 80 percent formula if it had a modular or portable then you would automatically be eliminated from the list if that's what Mr. Harrell is trying to say. We yeah. can give some wording if that's your That is my intent, intent because we were asking the taxpayer to St. Tammany you know our intent was to try to eliminate portable buildings and which during that transition we may have capacity but it's hopefully we're trying to get rid of that capacity. And, and I agree with you, Charles, because a lot of our last bond issue was directed towards our modulars and getting permanent construction. So, I mean, uh, you know, we have to address all of these concerns while we're adopting this policy. So, um, do you, you understand where he's coming from, Ray? I still, I still believe, just for, for what if, we, we build a new school and the first couple of years we're not at 80 percent capacity. And this will fall into it, even if you have a modular or what on the campus. I mean, that to me, 80 percent is your rule. And if we get to 80 percent, well, I, you know, I understand what Charles is saying, and I and I agree with Charles on this. I mean, I'll be quite honest. I think it's, you know, I think you're talking about two different qualifying events. One is 80 percent capacity of all available classrooms, which would include modulars and portables as opposed to saying that if you have, you don't have enough capacity at your school currently that you have to have a modular or a portable building at that school site, then you're automatically exceeding capacity. No matter how many, we could have 20 modulars out there or portables. Well, I, you know, I, I, that's what I think Charles is trying to reference. And we're working diligently to try to get these other you know, non-permanent buildings transferred into permanent structures, which all cost money. So there again, that's what we're dealing with is money. Aren't, and aren't, aren't all of our schools at 80% capacity already? We're, ru we're running those numbers now. We don't, we don't have the numbers for you tonight. And should we vote on this without that knowing that? Well, apparently we, we have to do something because this act was signed into law already and we have to make some kind of policy. Yes, they, yes, we have to have a policy. The school started today. So we're getting people that are calling to us wanting to know what our policy is. Yes, I think we have to have a policy. Okay. Any other comments? Ms. Hines. Uh, Mr. Alfred, I just wanted to remind you that this will come before the full board next week. And um, Mr. Foles has uh, mentioned to us that he's going to continue to uh, talk to other school boards about this and uh, seek uh, additional input if necessary from Danny Garrett and LSBA so uh, Mr. Foles I would appreciate that and, and you can give us an update before we take a final vote on this policy next week correct? I'll be glad to I'm, I'm, I think yeah I'll be glad to. All right, thank you. Okay thank you Ms. Hines. Mr. Hennigan. 
I wonder if we could, uh, as a board, invite any of the St. Tammany Parish legislators that voted for this to come and uh, talk to the board at our next meeting. Could, is that possible? We can extend that invitation to them? <laughs> Trey doesn't want to. <laughs> I'll be glad to. I, I, I think this is a law. I mean, the possibility of tweaking or changing a young I, law. I don't want to change the I'd like to have now. them explain it to us. What was their intent? At least invite them. Sure. We're Be welcome. We would, I think the, the public and the board would like to understand your intent representing St. Tammany, why you voted for this. So, legislators, they voted yes for this bill. Be glad to. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Harold. In reference to Neil's comment, I would assume every legislator from St. Tammany Parish would have voted against this. I'm, I'm uh, not if not, could we have a listing, ask somebody to pull a, a listing of the votes? We certainly, our can, delegation? We, we certainly can do that. Okay, thanks. Because that will be the ones that we're extending the invitation to, correct? Okay. Right. Okay. All right. Now, any other comments, questions regarding the substitute motion or amendment, substitute amendment motion that's on the floor regarding ex extending the capacity requirements? Any questions by board members? Seeing none from the public. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? So ordered. Okay, so. We've got that included into that item D or a new section G. Right. Okay. Um, is is this draft? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, any other questions by board members other regarding other issues? So we're still back to the original motion. And we're right? back to the original motion. Any other changes or questions or comments? Yes. Mr. <coughs> Bettencourt. Back to that. D that we just voted on um, just from, from Mr. Post if you look at it with that word optimal I mean there may be a way to, a way of just rewording this uh, to include optimal to me could be you, you could construe that as meaning the the permanent structure on that campus you know so there, there may be a way of just rewording some some of that to uh, make it a little bit more powerful thank you Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions, comments regarding the the policy? I'm going to ask, if I may, Mr. Foles, it, if the board does vote and approve this, is this going to be posted on our website or something, some as a draft form or or anything? No. No, sir. Okay. Because right, there's a lot in here that re regards to the eligib ineligibility about discipline and those types of things that I think the public would want to know that we are restricting based on what's already within well, the policy. Certainly, once the policy is passed, it would certainly be part of our of the website, and all of our policies are listed on our website. Okay. All right. Okay. Seeing no other questions or comments by board members on the main motion. Um, any from the public? Yes, Ms. Berrios. Ms. Berrios, retired teacher. Um, I agree it's pretty obvious that this, uh, the intent of this was to undermine the traditional school systems. Um, I think that as tough as you can make it, the better. This is an opportunity since uh, it's kind of crazy that they've given local school districts the ability to write their own policy. It's, I think that's, again, going to be chaos. But uh, since charters can set uh, their enrollment, they obviously can keep out any students that they want. So they wouldn't be really affected by this. Schools like Lush or those high few high-performing charters. But I just wonder, is there um, some provision or do you foresee any problem with athletic eligibility with students coming from or leaving our parish? Is that, is that addressed in any way? We did address that in the policy saying that there was a responsibility of the parent of the um, student that was coming in to determine their eligibility 
um, into our system, then of course we have a responsibility as individual schools and principals to determine if they are indeed eligible in our system. So we would that would be part of the confirmation, either both from the receiving and the other, uh, from the receiving principal as well. Which, as everyone knows, that's done by the LHSA, not necessarily within the school systems themselves. So that's an outside uh, association that actually does that as far as the eligibility. So, okay, with all that being said, we're ready to vote. All those in favor say aye. aye. Oppose, abstain, so ordered. Okay. Moving on to item 10, administrative, Mr. Jabby. Thank you, Mr. Derman. Uh, the monthly maintenance and custodial, custodial report is in your packet. Uh, before we move on, I would like to sincerely thank these three guys behind me and their staff, Wade, Jimbo, and Jeff. Tremendous job they did this summer getting us ready for the opening of school. So I want to take this opportunity to thank them for all of their hard work. It's amazing the amount, the quality, and the quantity of work that they can, they can put out, and I appreciate their efforts. And they're here to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? Uh, Mr. Betancourt. Did we get that situation with the chillers or whatever at Slide Owl all taken care of? Yes, sir. Okay. Up and rolling. Thank so you. it's no longer an emergency. I was there today, Mr. Betancourt, and it was mighty cool and um, very nice and comfortable. They spray painted it on the side of it, Jimbo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right. All right, moving on to B, monthly risk management report. Yes, sir. Mr. Gaspard is here to answer any questions you may have. Any questions by board members? Seeing none, monthly transportation report. Item That's C. also in your packet. Ms. Amon, Ms. Bueller here, and I'm going to take this opportunity, too, that we had a very smooth day today. I know they've been working many long hours and a lot of phone calls, but getting transportation ready for the opening school, and I appreciate their efforts. Thank you very much, Kathy and Donnell. Thank you all. Any questions by board members? It must have been a really smooth first day. <laughs> no, no questions or comments. Very good. Thank you all. Uh, Thank you. Item 11, construction. Ms. Tipton. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I have several substantial completions uh, first. First item is recommends acceptance of Folsom Elementary School, roofing replacement of admin, administration, gym, and classrooms is substantially complete subject to the architect's recommendations, submission of all regulatory requirements, and approval of Superintendent Fols, St. Tammany Parish School Board Project number 1319. So moved by Mr. Loop, second by Ms. Heinz. Any questions or comments by board members from the public? All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstain? So ordered. Item two. Recommends acceptance of Lee Road Junior High School re-roofing of cafeteria and classroom building is substantially complete, subject to the architect's recommendations, submission of all regulatory requirements, and approval of Superintendent Foles, St. Tammany Parish School Board Project Number 1320. Moved by Mr. Luke. Second by Mr. Harrell. Any comments or questions by board members? By the public? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstain? So ordered. Item three. Recommends acceptance of Slidell Junior High re-roofing of old sixth grade wing as substantially complete subject to the architect's recommendation, submission of all regulatory requirements, and approval of Superintendent Foles, St. Tammany Parish School Board Project Number 1321. Okay. Moved by Mr. Lamar, second by Mr. Alford. Any comments or questions by board members from the public? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? So ordered. Item four. Recommends acceptance of Boyette Junior High gym floor replacement as substantially complete subject to the architect's recommendations, submission of all regulatory requirements, and, and approval of Superintendent Fols. St. Tammany Parish School Board Project Number 1322. 
Moved by Mr. Alfred, seconded by Mr. Jeter. Any comments or questions by board members from the public? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstain? So order. Item 5. Recommends acceptance of Sodell High School classroom wing re roofing phase 2 as substantially complete, subject to architect's recommendations, submission of all regulatory requirements, and approval of Superintendent Foles, St. Tammany Parish School Board Project Number 1327. Moved by Mr. Lamarck, seconded by Ms. Mullet. Any comments or questions by board members from the public? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstain? So order. Recommends, I'm sorry, item number six, excuse me. Recommends acceptance of Fountain Blue High School phase one renovations as substantially complete, subject to the architect's recommendations, submission of all regulatory requirements, and approval of Superintendent Foles, St. Tammany Parish School Board Project Number 1460. Moved by Mr. Bettencourt, seconded by Ms. Sealing. Any questions or comments by board members from the public? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? So abstain, so ordered. Number seven. Recommends acceptance of Covington High School <coughs> replacement of exterior doors as substantially complete, subject to the architect's recommendations, submission of all regulatory requirements, and approval of Superintendent Fulce, St. Tammany Parish School Board Project Number 1471. And I so move. Second. Second by Mr. Loop. Any comments or questions by board members? Ms. Heinz. I just have to comment. Those doors look so nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. It makes a big difference. Any comments by the public? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstain? So ordered. Item 8. We have uh, consideration of bids from Madisonville Elementary School, new classroom building. Uh, at your uh, at the counter tonight, you should have a memo from me to Mr. Foles. We did receive bids for Madisonville Elementary new classroom building yesterday. And um, we're recommending acceptance of the low base bid plus alternate number one submitted by CM Combs Construction LLC in the amount of $2,944,000 for the new classroom building at Madisonville Elementary, St. Tammany Parish School Board Project number 1445. Moved by Ms. Heinz. Seconded by Mr. Loop. Any discussion or comments from board members? Seeing I have one question for you. Um, on this particular um, uh, construction project, how many classrooms is that? The base bid was 10 classrooms and restrooms, which uh, was to replace the number in the modular wing. And the alternate number one is two additional classrooms. So it's 12 classrooms total. 12 total. I think that just looks at some of our construction costs yes, we were talking about. Okay, thank you. Mr. Bettencourt, I'm sorry. Yes, sir, go ahead. I'm sorry. <clears throat> With 13 bids, that, that had to be a pretty good bid, a winning bid, right? With that many people? Yes, sir, it was very Would that competitive. Come pretty close to like what you were figuring? Yes, sir. The uh, bond issue construction budget for this project was three million eighty thousand, so it's under budget. And that was just for the ten classrooms, right? Yes, before sir. That the, was just before the, so we actually got two other additional classrooms and were able to stay under what we had budgeted for the project. Yes, also, very encouraged to see so many bidders, which speaks highly of upcoming work. Uh, so <coughs> excited about that. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you. Yes, very much so. Okay. And we have a motion on the floor, so we've got a vote so Ms. Heights can try to get a new school wing in down there. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. aye. I'm sorry, wait a minute, wait a minute. Did I ask for a public comment? Harry's keeping me straight. Okay, being none, now. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstain? So ordered. Thank you. Okay. Now, moving on to item B, monthly construction report, like you haven't been doing all this other stuff. Yes, sir. Uh, just a short report again. Um, as you notice, 
for seven items under construction tonight. That's most of our summer projects finishing before the school year opened today. There were roof warranty inspections happening this week. Um, any punchless work or completion items will be done after school hours from here on out on those projects. Um, there is one project among the summer projects that uh, did extend beyond the summer days and that's Covington High. That is a large uh, roofing job, but um, they have torn off all of the old roof and they do have it dried in. And uh, they did get everything off of the parking lot, all the materials. They are working after school hours and at night to finish and all they have left is the cap sheet and to finish the fascia soffit, which you can see they've uh, been working on through the summer and it's, it's coming together and taking shape, you can see. Um, with regard to our summer projects, as with all of our con projects, I do want to thank uh, particularly maintenance, but all of our departments certainly um, participate. IT comes and takes down security cameras, accounting is quick with munis and paying bills, but a heartfelt uh, thank you to maintenance because they always step in whenever we ask and they did really step up this uh, past weekend to help us out at Clearwood and we very much appreciate that always. They're, they're great to work with. Um, and there are a lot of others, as you know, that play into all of these items, governmental agencies, uh, permitting departments, and we have good working relationships across the parish with all of those. Of and it, it takes a lot of people and uh, not just here within the school board to make all of this happen. So we thank all of them. Uh, going on to our bond issue projects, Certainly we took the bids for Madisonville Elementary yesterday. The Clearwood Junior High addition and renovation project is scheduled to advertise for bids starting next week. And we're expecting to get those bids in in the middle of September and bring those to the October board meeting. We have a number of progress sets of design drawings that are sitting in construction right now. So now that the summer work is underway and school's in, we're going to really sit down and be looking at those review sets that have been coming in recently. But uh, I know that we have Ponch Train Chifuncta in our office, Slidell Junior, High HVAC. We actually met with the design team this afternoon. Carolyn Park Middle, cafeteria renovation uh, documents are in our office, as is Shatim Elementary. Um, those we have other design teams, they're all working on completion of uh, design development or construction documents. Um, so all of those projects are coming together and are progressing. At Woodlake, Kevin J. Smith is the completion contractor. They are on site. They've cleaned up and secured the site and they've started work on Wing 5 and um, so that is moving forward again as well. Okay, thank you. And, and I do want to um, thank you for all your efforts and maintenance and everybody. It's, it's a collective team effort to start this re-roofing and everything else off in the summer as soon as the kids leave, battle the weather conditions, and then get everybody yes, back in whole condition to start a couple months later. So we well. appreciate everyone's efforts. I know the board does. Ms. Ely, did you have a comment? Ms. Tipton, um, I understand that uh, Pearl River High School has our blueprints already, and that's exciting news. Um, what I needed to find out, and, and you know, I'm asking as we go along through this process, how long, again, look at timelines, time frames, and um, I noticed that um, in, on our form here um, that we show that the architect is still working on, on design development documents. Explain that to me if you don't mind. Um, typical to the uh, design industry and the contracts that go with that, you, you start from the very beginning of just identifying all the parameters of a job, everything that needs to be considered, okay. what goes in the classroom, this, that, and all that gets listed and from that uh, just a schematic design, a preliminary design gets sketched up. It's, it's just the process of getting from that earliest point to a full set of contract documents that can be put out for bid that include all the details, okay. all the specifications for every single thing that goes into a project and how it's built. 
Now, that's once a this, lot of work. oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. thank you. That's a lot of work. So, there are uh, there are three, four phases: programming, schematic design, design development, construction documents, okay. before you can go out for bid. Okay, that um, was my question. Yes. So Thank we're you. somewhere in the development in the middle of it. And the documents that they've seen at the school are between schematic design and design development, and there's been feedback between the administrators and the design team. Thank okay. you, Ms. Tipton. Thank you very much. Mr. Foles. Thank you, Ms. Hi uh, Mr. Derman. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day. Um, uh, yeah, if we, d if we did, uh, before we did close, I did want to just say a couple words about the start of school today. You know, last week when I talked to our administrators as part of our conference, we revealed our theme, which is moving forward, children, community, and commitment. And also at that meeting, I talked about uh, I want this school system to always be relevant in our community, in St. Tanny Parish. And I think what you saw today at the opening of school, we were at Abney Elementary School. They're celebrating their 50th year as a school, Lyon Elementary is celebrating their 50th year. We had 11 different media outlets covering the start of the St. Tanner Parish Public School System today. And it certainly tells me that we are relevant in what we're doing. And it, it starts right here with your board members and it goes to our central office people, the staff that we have here, our principals, and then our assistant principals and the faculty and staff of the school, and then the parents and then the students. And then as Cameron just mentioned, this is a community effort. We don't get all this done without the community helping us. And I think that second component, children, community, commitment, children first, the community, the relevancy of our school system in our community is important. I told many reporters today that I realize that if our school system is successful, then the businesses in our public and our agencies are successful as well. And our businesses believe in us and what we're trying to accomplish in St. Tony Parish. And I know sometimes everything just works well and it looks good and there'll be hiccups and bumps along the way and sometimes we take it for granted. But I'll tell you, to get to today's point took a lot, a lot of work by a lot of people. You saw in those teachers' classrooms today, that didn't happen overnight. I guarantee you those teachers were up there all summer long putting up different things, making sure that first day went as well as it did. Tonight, during this meeting, I've been hearing from many principals that are still up there t at their schools, kind of weighing into me, letting me know how their first day went, how happy they were, and how happy of everything that went so well. So I, I just want to say a thank you to everyone that was helped us, everyone that made the day possible. I know there will be bumps along the way, but I, I, as I said to um, someone of the other media, no matter what the issues are, and I know we're dealing with Common Core and we're dealing with all the different things that go with that, at the end of the day, it's the teacher in the classroom. When you shut the door and there's nothing else, it's the teacher in the classroom. And in St. Tanny Parish Public Schools, we are blessed to have teachers that want to make sure it's the children, the community, the commitment 24-7, 365 for every child every day. We're blessed to have that. I thank everyone that did their part to make that happen. And I'm looking forward to a great year with all of us working together to do what we need to do to make this system the best it can be for every child every day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Folks. Ms. Heinz, announcements from the President. Mr. Derman, before we adjourn, um, uh, uh, Mr. Foles gave well-deserved accolades to our, our teachers, our administrators, transportation, we heard tonight, um, human resources, maintenance, central office, but I, I believe he left out uh, some very important people, and we would like to say a special thank you to you, Superintendent Foles, and to Ms. Araby and Mr. Jabia. We know that you've uh, worked very hard this summer, and we appreciate it, and we know that all of our teachers and students and parents appreciate it too so thank you very much for your hard work thank you miss science <laughs> thank you mr Foles. and like she said our most important product is our students so we want to we want to encourage them to have fun at school this whole school year and learn and learn and learn every child every day with no further business come before the board we're adjourned